we build creative communities, or at least we try to. Uh, we are architects and designers uh, based in Los Angeles, um, kind of different uh, to uh, quite a lot of the other uh, types of skills and disciplines that uh, uh, you guys are all part of. Um, but we're moving very much to a, a cross-disciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary world. And I think the more we share the way we think, uh, the more positive uh, uh, things can be. I titled this The Theatre of Work because I think uh, that work is where we spend most of our waking hours. And uh, it's been a horribly underserved uh, area of the environment, um, really for, forever. Um, but that's all been changing in the last 10 to 15 years uh, with all sorts of experimentations um, and a lot more thought put into how people work. And, and a lot of that's been driven by the creatives uh, themselves through uh, different uh, uh, creative industries. So architecture, in my view, frames the theatre of human experience. Um, and to become theatre, a building must address community structures, knowledge sharing, choice and opportunity, social bonds, and tribal organization and connectivity. And th things like tribal organization and connectivity becoming more and more a tangible, uh, important aspect of our lives because we are becoming more clearly defined and, and segmented into tribes. And the world's changed dramatically in the last uh, uh, 100 years or so. Um, <clears throat> we continue to use old tools to solve new problems. An incredibly uh, auspicious uh, observation that uh, Marshall McC McEwen made way back in probably about 1965. Um, and in a way, so much of the space that surrounds us, um, in a way, is carrying on traditions of, of thinking and thought um, and old images about culture that uh, really are no longer part of, of our world today. And that's become increasingly obvious given that uh, the digital uh, age has uh, transformed our uh, daily lives so dramatically. Back again in the 60s, Jacques Tati's work was uh, observing, uh, uh, the filmmaker, many of you I'm sure know, was, a, was observing this kind of uh, schism between uh, modernity and the, the advance of technology and how to adapt that uh, to our world. And indeed, we've gone through a whole number of eco economical uh, kind of uh, paradigm shifts in the last 300 years. We've gone from an agricultural uh, economy, which was uh, prevalent really you know, back to the Stone Age practically, um, through an industrial economy, which lasted a fair, a fair period of time, um, to the service economy, which uh, really uh, uh, dates probably to about 1920, when uh, the, the number of uh, white-collar workers actually exceeded the number of blue-collar workers um, in the, the developed world. Um, to what we call kind of roughly an idea economy. Um, we probably still don't know enough about it to actually name it, uh, where all the conditions are actually changing, and we are much more global, local uh, at the same time. We're networked, we have unlimited mobility, and we're an innovation-based uh, economy. You innovate or die. Um, so talking about <laughs> old tools, um, it's amazing to us that really the, way, you know, the, the options to work have just been a desk or an office for so long. And the office, in fact, is only driven by primarily a status thing. If you, if you spend enough time with a company and you achieve enough, perhaps you get an office, and then that office can also uh, evolve to a corner office or to a suite, and you can actually measure your life by you know, the square footage of uh, your surroundings, which is uh, paramountly ridiculous in our current age. And we've also uh, moved from a paper economy, which was the primary vehicle of transacting business for, I don't know, 600 years since the invention of the printing press in about 1450 um, <clears throat> to uh, uh, a digital economy where we don't rely on paper anymore and in fact we are slowly being released uh, from paper entirely. In 10 years I, I think it's going to be kind of an anachronism that's used for um, artistic reasons. And indeed the conception of how people work in space uh, has changed enormously. It's, got, it's like we've learned things and we've also unlearned things. Uh, the image on the left, uh, it was a, a painting by a Renaissance painter, I've forgotten uh, his name, um, imagining St. Jerome in his uh, uh, study uh, around about 600 AD. So this is a projection from a Renaissance painter looking 800 year, years earlier and imagining the surroundings of this, uh, uh, this uh, famous uh, scholarly saint. Um, in, an, in an environment that is so rich in symbols, and I actually can't begin to enumerate these all, uh, those birds and things like that on the threshold there have symbolic meaning, um, in addition to, of course, the spatial kind of uh, configurations that project back from the viewer. Um, there is a novel in that one painting, 
and then we look at the environment that we work in today, and it's kind of broken down into basics that work sometimes and sometimes don't work. And interestingly, the image on the right is from Shiat Day's 1995 first experiment with a virtual office uh, in Venice, California, which lasted a couple of years before um, <clears throat> all sorts of problems kind of uh, hit them, like the fact that all their clients were still using paper even though they weren't, um, and they had to use the trunks of their cars as filing cabinets. Um, <coughs> But they partially solved the problem of, uh, of mobility in the office, except for things like, of course, the ergonomic challenges of that kind of chair. So another fascinating thing is in the last 15 years, routine work uh, across the border has uh, uh, reduced uh, massively, and non-routine work uh, has been escalating. And uh, I think this is also uh, uh, yet another uh, sort of piece of data that underscores the importance of the knowledge economy. Um, and also, of course, technology is, uh, is rapidly advancing to such an extent that we are looking at things like lunar modules as our potential future homes. Um, some of that ridiculous, but then there's another aspect of our brains which is fascinating, which is that we adapt to these technological changes and our brains are changing. We no longer have the brains of our great-great-grandparents. <coughs> and as far as the workplace goes, the, the model has changed, as everyone knows, from a highly individual, a segmented, with a small amount of group space to a blurred relationship between these spaces and an increased emphasis on, on group and, and collaboration. And the goal, uh, ultimately, of pretty much all of our clients is how do you get one community uh, unified and working together and kind of rubbing off each other synergistically. And then, <clears throat> uh, together with this kind of digital age transformation, um, our buildings and our spaces increasingly will be built by uh, computers. Um, fabricated by computers. This happens to be part of the cutting pattern of the plywood uh, uh, elements in the Barbarian Superdesk, which we'll show you in a moment. So what sh factors shape the new workplace? Um, we think there are six things. The culture model, the urban paradigm, disruption and play, fluidity and transparency, choice and diversity, human scale, community, and collaboration. The most fascinating one, in a way, because people find it so hard to define, is the culture model. How does our workplace fit into our culture and what we understand to be our culture in this moment in time? And it's really interesting, uh, the, the projections that happened uh, you know, 40, 50 years ago. These are the, uh, uh, Melvin Sikorsky did some incredible photographs in Paris of uh, uh, models in uh, these uh, dome elements, uh, globes floating in space. And it's such a, a kind of a symbol of uh, the future kind of melding with, with history and the past. Uh, that's, that's still kind of provocative and fascinating today. And then there's a convergence of commercial aspirations, which is very, very different. Um, how things like uh, the future sales and history as a billboard and mo modernity in motion kind of overwhelm our city and overwhelm our culture. And it's our job really as designers to find a way of organizing this, this type of chaos. And I put these uh, two images together because they're, they're, they're really fascinating. It's Marie Antoinette, obviously, while she was uh, painted while she was still alive in about 1780, and a modern uh, woman. And the kind of similarities between uh, what's uh, referenced here and what is uh, 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 expressed are really great. But the thing that's most fascinating about this is that Marie Antoinette's hair is gray. Why is her hair gray? Well, in 1780, unlike today, power resided in old people. Um, if you had money, you were, were generally were old people who had power, and uh, so yeah, the youth aspired to be old, com complete opposite of, of where we are today. And this sort of underlines, again, the kind of changes that we've gone through where that was a culture of, of maturity and even extreme maturity, which uh, broke apart uh, around about the First World War for all sorts of uh, uh, very good reasons, and we are now in an immature culture, a culture of experimentation and, and, and uh, play. So on the left, we have the Palace of Versailles, but it's really, in some ways, not so different from uh, the image on the right, which is a project of ours uh, for Disney, where we, we made a lot of uh, storage uh, 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 hexagonal cubes uh, for storing the products that they were made at this uh, uh, headquarters building. So we have an opportunity for ordinary glamour that we can play with. Uh, the urban paradigm, fundamental uh, uh, kind of reference point for us in our work is the city. And the city, because it is a, a, a place uh, that everyone is familiar with, that, uh, uh, that everyone has a, a kind of a concat concatenation of images uh, in their heads, 
and therefore um, contains in a way the archetypes of what we believe to be the life we want to live. And so, so many of these words that we use in, um, in, in discussing with clients about neighborhoods and, and town halls and main streets and all the rest are really kind of based in the, in the medi medieval city um, and they're there for us to kind of uh, use and reinterpret uh, uh, almost endlessly. This is a, a project we did um, in, in London a few years ago um, where the client was, uh, was uh, uh, optimistic enough to break through six floors of office space and, and, uh, and pay for that leased space in order to create an atrium that would connect his different businesses together in a very dramatic way. So a vertical village uh, of a kind. Some images of that project. Disruption and play, um, also fundamentally important. One of the things that uh, uh, Jay Scheidt actually said to me way back in, in uh, 1990 uh, was that he didn't want his people to be comfortable. I think we had some conversation because at the time, being comfortable in your office was seen to be the right goal. And uh, that was pretty much what everyone was pushing. And Jay said, I don't want my people to be comfortable. I want them to be provoked. I'm not going to get great work out of people who are comfortable. And it made total sense. <clears throat> so the idea of serious play, of course, uh, there have been books written on this subject, um, is incredibly important. The, the, the architecture and the language of space is not something that is meant to make you go to sleep. I put this in because it's great. It's the same letters, uh, just slightly different. And of course, the meaning is so, so fundamentally different. So how you play with design, of course, um, very, with very small twists can become uh, uh, something that is either oppressive or um, uplifting. And this project, actually also for uh, the Disney store in uh, uh, Pasadena, um, they wanted a, a meeting space for 200 people and they didn't want to give up the space for that. So we said, well, if you added in the space in your main conference room um, and we, we could break down the wall, then you'd have your 200 person meeting space. So we made the wall out of uh, foam blocks, which also became the seats for people uh, at the meetings. And then it, we, we worked out it took uh, 25 minutes for two men to rebuild the wall every time they had a big meeting, which was quite reasonable. And that's the village uh, in a way that uh, we created in that warehouse building. And then also, I think it's, it's also fundamental to challenge all of those um, uh, components of the office. Uh, and this is JWT here in New York, where we, we did a lot of meeting rooms with soft walls for both uh, uh, money reasons and also uh, because it was fun. And then, of course, the super desk, where the desk itself became ridiculously big and also kind of a, like a soft element in the space. Fluidity and transparency. Um, we think it's, uh, it's fundamental uh, to promote a culture of transparency uh, within organizations because understanding and, and, and accessing information is, and knowing what everyone is doing is really fundamental to knowledge sharing. Um, <clears throat> as soon as you put up barriers and walls, there are things happening that are, that are out of reach and kind of suspicions arise in people's minds um, and it, it, it starts provoking the wrong uh, uh, feeling. But then also the other great thing about transparency is People are theatre, and the motion and activity of people within the workplace creates theatre, and I really do think it's our business to amplify that theatre, because this is the drama of human life that we spend most of our time with, and damn it, it should be fun. And of course, everything we are doing is kind of uh, 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 portable and uh, uh, short lifespan in many ways, because we're working on the insides of buildings, and uh, operations change, organizations change, shrink, uh, expand, and contract, move around, um, and we need to be uh, fundamentally flexible. <clears throat> we also have been very concerned about breaking down corridors. This is a diagram actually we did way back in 1999, showing a very conventional uh, plan of an office building in the upper, upper left center, um, <clears throat> and how all of the corporate offices around the perimeter kind of destroyed the environment for the people on the inside. And then, then our, our version for a digital studio for 20th Century Fox of the same time uh, treated the corridor as something that was an opportunity for people to uh, uh, use space in a completely different way, far more uh, collaborative and open and accessible. About 10 years ago, we got involved in doing Mother, uh, the advertising agency in London's offices, and that was also a great story about how the company had grown from a small table to an extremely large table. There was an opportunity to do a 200-person table, um, and we made this out of concrete because uh, it just seems such a ridiculous thing to do for an advertising agency. <laughs> People either love it or hate it. 
And it's so interesting, too, how in their occupation of this space, they've left, they've left it very raw, and they've engaged, they, they brought up our notion about uh, using Marimekko lampshades. We, we actually pilfered the warehouse of Marimekko's factory in Helsinki in order to get 52 different uh, 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 patterned fabrics in order to create these light uh, shades, which also actually dampen sound because they're acoustically uh, wrapped. I'm going to have to go a little faster. Choice and diversity. Offering people a range of opportunities within the workspace. Um, Google's headquarters uh, of 10 years ago. And then the range of, of workspaces, uh, 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 settings that we designed for Google. There were about 13 different work settings. And the plans below refer to the, the notion of zoning acoustic temperatures within the space so that there will be loud and active spaces and also quiet uh, uh, focused spaces off around the perimeters. Quick image of that project. And one of the most important things for us is the day in the life of a worker, that it, that it isn't a case of going to one desk and spending all, of day, all that day in one desk, that we need to be able to move and uh, interact with people, and so offices should be designed with that specifically in mind. <clears throat> this is uh, Macquarie in uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, one of the uh, uh, typical neighborhoods of 100 persons uh, each. Uh, each of space is designed very specifically around different work settings for different types of collaborative work. And that's the, uh, um, the atrium which really kind of celebrated collaborative work with these uh, cubes of meeting spaces across 10 floors. And the transparency we got with this bank was fan fantastic. Clients could actually look across the space from these meeting rooms, see the whole of the bank uh, in operation, and also um, not uh, uh, see anything on anyone's screens. So uh, the, the bank maintained its security and, and uh, conveyed an image of transparency and accountability to its clients. Human scale, community and collaboration. Small companies don't need much help. They act like extended families. Large companies need a lot of help because uh, of all the, the challenges of uh, alienation and issues like that. Um, this is about uh, looking at wired San Francisco's offices and how to uh, transform neighborhoods into flowing uh, spaces that move into one another rather than being uh, segmented into silos. And then lastly, the Barbarian Desk, um, Super Desk, designed for about 150 people. And then this is the kind of the cloud of 150 individual desks on, on one side and the, and the uh, unified community desk on the other. The initial sketch for that desk. And we really went from one sketch to drawings and then models, and we played with cardboard and paper to kind of understand these forms, and tried different colors, but went back to white. Um, wire mapped this in the computer, which took months, because it was uh, every little piece of uh, plywood had to be uh, adjusted uh, based on the structural engineer's uh, uh, calculations. And then in construction, it was kind of a fascinating uh, construction site, and the finished product. And the space is, of course, underneath. In order to keep the table uh, monolithic, we, of course, had to lift the table up, but were, we used the opportunity to create these great uh, collaborative spaces underneath the table. And then, if the table gets damaged, we had to think about a way of doing it, and it was uh, Benjamin Palmer's uh, uh, notion to use this Japanese uh, concept of kintsugi, where you accept the damage to the table and you amplify it in the uh, repair. So you use gold dust in the glue to uh, uh, <coughs> rejoin the pieces. And uh, so the effects of nature, are, are, in a way, are celebrated. So that's it. Thank you very much.